This morning, Pastor Craig will be continuing on in Matthew, and uh, this morning the reading will be from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare, make the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the baptism, or to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit, bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We do thank you for your promise of a future for us who call you as, our, as your Savior. Just pray this morning that you are with Pastor Craig as he presents your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And I dismiss the senior class to Sunday school as well. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite favorite statements in the Bible, John the Baptist, he's my, he's my guy. Going into ministry, I think I was very much a, a brood of vipers type of approach to, to ministry. I, I love that, love that statement. I found um, God has tempered me over the, over the years, but he evidently never did John the Baptist. And one of the reasons for that is, is because that was John's purpose, and that was God's plan for his life. And it's exciting to preach about this character because what's interesting about it is, is he kind of lives in the shadow of Jesus. He was the, and that's what he intended to do. And yet, uh, an amazing, an amazing person. This morning, the uh, message is the mission and message of the greatest preacher ever. Now, Jesus stated this in Matthew 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's, um, that's high praise, isn't it? Pretty amazing. And, and I don't know if we really get the gravity of that. But when you think about John the Baptist and you think about his origins, his conception was miraculous. Elizabeth was basically too old to have children, didn't, didn't even believe that this could be true. He was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. What's interesting about that is that we, in our New Testament, our uh, age of the church mentality, are thinking, well, that's what God wants for every one of us, is to be filled with the Spirit. But we have to understand that John the Baptist is, if you, if you looked at it theologically, he's Old Testament. Like, he's not New Testament. Christ hasn't risen from the dead. The, 
the helper has not come and access to the Spirit of God is not in every one of us at this point. So he's like the prophets of old. He's like the kings where God would come in to them or, or the prophets. It was particular in the way that the Holy Spirit reached out and, and touched people's lives and God used them specifically. Not only that, he was great in the sight of God and he was to be a herald of the Messiah, announcing and preparing people for his coming. That's what John the Baptist did. That's who he was. He was literally a great prophet. Now, John the Baptist said of himself, he said in John 1, 27, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And that's, that's such a humbling statement in the sense that he's not just talking about untying Jesus's sandals, what he's talking about is what Jesus did with his disciples. When he went and washed their feet, he humbled himself to demonstrate to them how to be servants of others. That's what John the Baptist is saying. I'm not even worthy to wash Jesus' feet. That's who I am. And yet Jesus called him the greatest preacher ever. If you... Um, Sorry. If you look at Malachi, it says there, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, and before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And Jesus said about that, that you are the ones you have missed this Elijah that was sent. This prophecy was sent to you, and you have missed him. For John came, I'm sorry, in verse 14 of Matthew 11, it says, For all of the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he goes on, and he says in verse 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. John the Baptist was, by Jesus' own words, if you can accept it, Elijah. He was the reincarnation that was prophesied by Malachi 400 years earlier. And so, Malachi here, I mean, basically, those are the last words. That's the last two verses in the Old Testament about Elijah coming and being a great Savior and, and, or someone who's coming is going to be a forerunner of this Savior of Jesus Christ. 400 years of silence took place, and now by this time, Israel is kind of a mess. They're under Roman rule. They uh, have split off into all kinds of different factions. They have um, these different characters like Pharisees and Sadducees. We'll look at that in a minute. And, and these different groups. And they're all self-righteous and all think they're so wonderful. And none of them, no matter how much they understood of the Scripture, no matter having that prophecy 400 years later, None of them carried forth with the idea that John the Baptist is this person. He is, for, he is foretold in Malachi, and he is the one foretelling of the Messiah that is going to rescue us. They didn't even recognize him. It's sad, really. And you know, that could be us. That could be you. The message of the gospel is proclaimed over and over and over again. In our world, I, I mean, I think of North America. Who doesn't know who Jesus is? You either love him or hate him. But people miss him all the time. They miss who he really is. Now we're going to talk about, as I said, the mission and the message of the greatest preacher ever. So we'll start with his mission, John the Baptist. 
His mission, it says in verse 1 of chapter 3, the first one, the first verse that Randy read, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. That was his mission, was to go to preach. He had the, the uh, responsibility to make sure that people knew about Christ. And as you look this over, as you hear this message this morning, I hope you see and maybe ask yourself, how am I making a difference in other people's lives? How am I fulfilling the mission that God has for every one of his children? Which is to do what John the Baptist is doing. Now you may not have to beheaded, be beheaded over it. I don't know what God's plan is for, is for your future. But the fact is, every one of us, when we, when we read that, when we read this story of John the Baptist, we should get excited because we have that same mission. His mission was to preach. Now, there were many different audiences that John the Baptist preached to. So if you go and look at, as I already mentioned, the Pharisees, there's the Sadducees. Those are the two that we've probably heard the most about. Maybe you've heard of the Sanhedrin. And just to clarify things, the different sects between the different groups of religious Jewish people that, are, that I just listed off, the Sanhedrin are really made up of all of these groups. They could be people from any one of these groups. The Sanhedrin would be the ruling priests over Jerusalem. And they would be the ones that would kind of you know, set the tone for things, and they were the ones that debated over whether Jesus um, should be arrested and put to death and, and those kinds of things. But then these different groups that you hear about, Pharisees and Sadducees, Essenes and Zealots, these were the four major ones. Pharisees were very much very uh, orthodox in their pursuit of following the laws of God. They were extremely orthodox, and in fact, so much so that, that they really believed in that. Like, that's what they began to believe in, not so much that God was going to be their Savior, but that if they were righteous enough, God would, I don't know how he's going to do it, I don't know what this Messiah is, if he's ever coming or not, but, but this is how I'm going to get salvation, is I am just going to be good enough. I think as you hear these descriptions, you begin to understand that some of us are Christians a little bit like each one of these groups. Maybe one of them really resonates with us. But the Pharisees, they were the ones that basically their goal was is to be better than their neighbor. You know, if you, uh, if you get chased by a bear, just run faster than the person with you. Then that's your salvation, Right? That was the Pharisees. The Pharisees were made up of a lot of working class. So they had jobs or uh, things that they did uh, as, as well as, you know, just practicing this. The Sadducees, on the, other, on the other hand, they were kind of the aristocrats, the elite class. They didn't necessarily all have labor-type jobs. And many of them uh, had no jobs at all. They just lived off from whatever wealth their families had given them. They were very liberal. They were the opposite of the Pharisees. The Sadducees, you know, you've maybe heard the comment or, or statement uh, that, that the Sadducees didn't, didn't believe in the resurrection, that that was a thing, that that was going to happen, and, and that's why they were sad, you see, <laughs> right? Come on, I, I have told that joke. I've been here for 25 years, Je Jesse. I've been here for 25 years, okay? And, and it's, you knew it was coming, right? Yeah, it was so predictable, but I had to do it anyway. But the Sadducees were, they had very liberal viewpoints, and so basically they were, basically if you're wealthy, God's going to love you and take you to heaven. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're really wealthy and you and you maybe use that wealth in good ways and do some things like that, but you don't have to, you don't have to follow every one of these rules and, and stuff like that. That's, that's pretty crazy. The Essenes, the Essenes were 
the radicals. So the Pharisees were very rigid, but the Essenes were radical. And John the Baptist, <clears throat> John the Baptist was uh, more than likely an Essene just by the description of him being from the wilderness, wearing camel hair, eating locusts and honey, all those things Essenes were known for. The Essenes sat around all day and scribed the scriptures, made copies of the scriptures, and that's one of the reasons that we found the Dead Sea Scrolls is because they hid them in caves and, um, and they were discovered in, what was it, 1947, I think. Those were the Essenes. They figured that if we live an aesthetic life like this, an ascetic life to the point where we've you know, given up everything of any worldly value, that then somehow God is going to be pleased with us and we're going to, and we're going to go to heaven. We're going to have that salvation. And then the zealots. And I would say that, you know, like zealots, there are many, there are many of those in Christianity today. I wanted to call them Republicans, but I decided not to <clears throat> because I, I would be, that would be offensive. So I wouldn't say they were like that. I, I don't think that Republicans are necessarily just zealots, but but they definitely think they're going to overthrow the government and they're going to fix the whole world just by their might or their power or maybe even by putting somebody, assassinating somebody or that kind of thing. And Republicans aren't about that at all, by the way. But, but I just thought, you know, in some ways there are, there are many, many of them that get so zealous with these ideas that they're just going to fix the world with the government. You know, if we can just fix the government, we fix the whole world. And so that was, that's what I mean by that, the zealots. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the zealots. And basically, everybody else was just kind of living under their umbrella. They just had to do whatever they, you know, whatever the ruling parties that were in charge. And these were, these had, they had some real rules. I mean, the Pharisees had, we know, over 650 rules. But not only that, the Pharisees had, like, you had to be, um, uh, you, you had to be on probation for like a year after they accepted you into their group. So they were pretty refined about how they made up this group of people. And, um, and so did the other groups, but they maybe weren't, we don't have all the information on those. So that's the group that he was preaching to. And you see that later on. We'll look at it a little bit more in that great statement that he makes, you brood of vipers. And he's saying that to the religious groups that are coming in for baptism. Now, a second thing that was a part of his mission was preparing. So he had the mission of preaching and the mission of preparing. And who was he preparing for? He was preparing for Jesus. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. This was a common thing that would happen. When Isaiah made this quotation or, or, or wrote down this prophecy, the thing that was, uh, that, that was a part of that was being able to understand that this is what anybody did for a king. And so this is the way that you prepared for a king. You went through, and you remember <clears throat> stories of when, uh, uh, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and uh, they're waving palms the week before Passover and they're praising God and they're laying down their cloaks on the road. They're preparing the way for the king to come. And that's literally what that preparation was about except the thing is is that not everybody understood that maybe even you know john the baptist understood it in isaiah 40 verses 4 through 5 there's more explanation of it so that prophecy of isaiah the voice of one crying in the wilderness that's verse uh, 3 of isaiah 40 and then verses 4 and 5 every valley shall be lifted up Every mountain and hill be made low, the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
So he's there to clear the way to herald the arrival of Jesus Christ. And really, he's, he's making the path straight and easy to walk on. That's the whole point. That's why Isaiah lays it out that way. But I think it's interesting because when you read it, you're like, man, why does why so many words to describe making the way straight and the, and the plain easy and level? Why so many words? And I think because it's a spiritual preparation. If you apply it that way, if you understand that John the Baptist is there to prepare hearts for the Lamb of God, that's what he that's how he announced them. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's a spiritual preparation. If you think about the work that it takes, that it would take to level mountains, to raise up valleys, to do things like that. I mean, we do that all the time with all of our equipment and, and our technology today. But when you think about it in their day, to be able to do that would seem almost impossible. And that is almost the work of trying to prepare the heart for Jesus Christ. That's the miraculous work that takes place in our lives. God has to remove obstacles in our lives. We have the mission, the same mission that John the Baptist had of preparing people's hearts for the truth of the gospel message. And we should understand that that's not an easy thing to do. It's a miraculous thing that takes place. And that's what is illustrated there by that prophecy by Isaiah. It's that it's a, it's a miraculous thing that takes place in the heart of a person who comes to know Christ and to give and yield their life to him. It's miraculous. And yet, that is the job that God has put before us. And I hope we understand that, that we are not unlike John the Baptist. We have a responsibility, and we have a message to share. So what is his message? We talked about the, miss, the mission of, John, of the greatest preacher. What's the message of the greatest preacher? Well, you can't read this passage of Scripture without understanding that repentance is at the heart of it. Repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's verse 2. What does he say when he talks to the Pharisees? He talks to them about their need to repent. Now, first of all, when we look at the nature of what repentance is, we need to understand it this way. Repentance is when we turn away from what we're doing that is in opposition to God's will, and we turn toward something else. Now, we begin to pursue a different line in our life. This is where people get confused, most confused. Because to them, repentance many times means admitting I'm guilty. And that's only half the equation. Oftentimes, I mean, I am not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, the, I've said before that I, this isn't where you come for the warm fuzzies a lot of times at Bible Fellowship because, because I'm not going to let people go out of here thinking we're all good. That we're all just, all we got to do is have, you know, more positive thinking and, and we'll be wonderful. And our lives will be much better and improved as we come out of this place. We will be much improved people as soon as we at least admit that we're lost without a Savior. We will be most improved and, and it is the greatest justice I can do to your life is to cause you to realize that you are a sinner. Because that is the beginning of repentance. But it's not the end of it. Because repentance includes having to pursue the opposite, or a different life, or a better route, or the way that God is really calling you to live and to be. 
And so you can't have one without the other. If you have repentance, but then you never embrace Christ and make him your savior. If you have repentance and you never make him Lord of your life, then you've missed the boat. You don't have a full understanding of what this means. When John the Baptist says it, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a very interesting statement, the kingdom of heaven. You know that Matthew is the only uh, one who uses that term? All the other writers of gospels all use the kingdom of God. It's, I don't think that it really is significant. Um, in fact, there's one point where Matthew actually uses the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God in the same verse, and he uses them synonymously. And I believe that's the way they're meant to be used. A lot of, um, a lot of commentators, a lot of Christians down through the ages have debated. You know, I've, I once heard a whole sermon about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And here's the difference. Matthew is a writer to the Jewish people. Now, you have to understand Jewish people, they don't, they don't use the name Yahweh. They don't use the name Jehovah. You know what? A lot of times, the word they use is heaven. When they talk about God, when they refer to heaven, they mean God himself, because that's where he resides. You know, if, if you say heaven help us, what do you really mean? God help us. God help me. And I believe that's exactly what Matthew was getting at, because as we talked about earlier weeks, we've talked about this kingdom, uh, or I'm sorry, this, um, this message that Matthew has is to the Jewish people, and he's giving them something that's a little more palatable than kingdom of God. He's giving them something that, that understands their struggle with naming God in any way or fashion. There's five kingdoms that are talked about in the Bible, and I think we should clarify that a little bit because as, as, um, as John says here, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that's his message. That's what he's preaching. We need to kind of understand this because people get confused by all these, these kingdoms. First of all, there's the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there's the prophesied kingdom. Daniel, for instance, talked about the kingdom of God. Um, it was a looking forward to all of what we see today and all of what we're still looking forward to. So in other words, it's a very general idea of the kingdom of God. As time goes on, John the Baptist begins to realize, and Jesus says this as well, that the kingdom of God is at hand. And this term becomes something that the gospel writers use to describe, or even Jesus uses to describe the current times. So in other words, the appearance of Jesus the Messiah ushers in a form of the kingdom. He's going around, he is healing people, people are being raised from the dead, there's miracles, thousands are being fed, all kinds of things are happening that indicate that the kingdom is at hand, it's here. And even that term, it leaves us with an understanding of, it's, it's at hand, it's, it, there is potential for it. I've heard lots of people speculate about what would happen if the Israelite, if the Jewish people would have accepted their Messiah. What if John the Baptist would have preached, said, here is the Messiah? What if the Jewish people would have repented and said, here is our Messiah? What if they would have accepted him? And, you know, the, the way the, uh, the thinking goes is that that would usher in the millennial kingdom. That would have been the beginning of Christ's reign here on earth. And it would have just, things would have gone on and we wouldn't have what we have right now, which is the church age, which is the age when Gentiles, when people like you and I 
have access to the message of God. I don't know why there's so much speculation about that. I don't know what difference it makes, for one thing. And I also don't understand what they would have done with all the prophecies that are about the end of the age that are in the Old Testament. So, you know, Daniel would have been like, come on, you threw me under the bus. Like, I wrote all this stuff down. I was sure that's what you meant. So I don't think there's a lot of purpose in that, but I think we do need to understand that there was that period of time where Jesus came. And, and even, you know, we understand it. Jesus said, Father, if this cup can pass from me. So in other words, like maybe we can do this thing, right? But it wasn't meant to be because that wasn't the will of the Father. So that's the kingdom at hand that you read about from time to time. And then I would call it, I mean, there's many different names of it, but I'd call it the interim kingdom. The interim kingdom is what we live in today. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of God. The helper has come. And we are able to live in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, leading and guiding our lives today. That's the kingdom we live in right now. This is, uh, as I've heard some describe it, it's like, a, it's like a comma in history. It's a pause. Maybe it's more like a hyphen or, or a colon or something, or lots of colons, I don't know, but it seems like it, right? But a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years to the Lord, so let's not get worried about it. But it's the interim kingdom that we live in. And this is a kingdom where it exists in our hearts because the Spirit of God lives in us. That's why in Sunday school we teach little children, you need to accept Jesus into your heart. That's the concept that we're trying to portray or help them understand, that God lives in you. This is, this is uh, the, literally the first, the first sermon that I preached at Bible Fellowship was an explanation of the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is within you from John chapter 4. He reigns in our lives. You know what? If he reigned in all of our lives, Bible fellowship would be perfect. That'd be awesome. Except we're not, because we're all made up of sinners. And you know what? We all understand that. And we all give each other grace and mercy like God gives us. But this is the interim kingdom that we live in. And we hope that Christ is reigning in our lives. And then there's the millennial kingdom that's yet to come. This is when Christ returns and he destroys the ten nations that come against him. And, and the Antichrist and the beast and they're all and the false prophet are all put to death. And he now reigns, except for the beast, the beast will be cast into the abyss, and for a thousand years Christ will reign. But that doesn't mean everything's fixed yet, because then there's the eternal kingdom, and the beast is cast out forever, and we all live under the power and authority of God. And so these are the five kingdoms that the Bible talks about, the five major references to it. And I just wanted you to understand this is where this is where John the Baptist is speak, speaking from. He's still speaking from pre-Gentile. He's still speaking pre-church. He is speaking to his Jewish brothers and sisters and sharing this gospel message. And that way we don't get messed up on things. Sometimes we get messed up and we think, oh, I'm, I'm John the Baptist. No, no, you're whoever you are, whoever God's called you to be. When God wants to raise up a John the Baptist, I guess he will. And then John the Baptist is here, and his message is to repent and bear fruit. And this is the other side of it. So if you're going to repent and turn away, but then what are you going to do with it? Are you going to bear fruit? I could leave the message right there, except that's kind of interesting, isn't it? What does that really mean? 
to bear fruit. What, why is John saying that? Jesus said that. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. What does that really mean? There are so many believers today that understand the message of salvation, that understand repentance, that have cleaned up their lives in some positive ways. But are they bearing fruit? Because that is a step in the whole journey. In verses 3, 8 through 10, I'm sorry, in chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It is interesting because the Jewish people... As wonderful as it is, as wonderful as Israel, as the Israelite people are and how they have carried this, this message of the gospel, have produced all the prophets, have produced our Savior, and yet have missed him, every one of them is saved the same way we are today. For John the Baptist, his message was, every one of you is saved through repentance and trusting in God and his future hope of a Savior. Who happens to be this Messiah? The Lamb of God. This is who you put your trust in. For us today, it is now a Messiah, a Savior, that has been raised from the dead and lives in heaven today. And we put our hope and trust in him. So even more so, it's no wonder it's no wonder as Peter shared that message of Acts chapter 2 and he's talking to them, repent and be baptized. He's like, you know, in all these nations, all these people are gathered together and these Israelites from all different parts of the, of the world at that time are there at Pentecost and they are being preached at from Peter and this is the Messiah that you crucified and 3,000 were saved that day. That should be no wonder to us. Because that is the message of the gospel, and it was right there in their faces. We have this Savior. We have the message of the gospel. We have the message of the Bible. We have, we have the testimony of those who were martyred because of that testimony. Like, they, I'd rather you put me to death than I recant what I know to be true. That's literally what happened. We have all that. We put our trust in Jesus Christ for that reason. Because he is God's son. Because he was the perfect one. And we give all of our hope into one basket. That's what we hope for. That's our hope for eternity. That's our hope for the future. And that's our hope for salvation. You see, self-righteousness just produces a false sense of a closeness to God. You know, if we're just righteous for righteousness' sake, you know, we actually we get to live a pretty decent life. Like there's a lot of things that righteous living brings to a person's life. But if we're just doing it for the sake of being perceived good by everyone around us, then it's not producing anything. It's not producing any fruit, is it? You see, true righteousness produces fruit. Philippians 11, 1, 1 11 says this, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. So there's a fruit that's produced by our righteousness. So in other words, our righteous acts have a purpose beyond ourselves. Even beyond our own salvation. The purpose of it is to produce fruit. And what is that fruit? Well, I believe it's the message of the gospel being real 
to the people around us. They see the righteousness that they struggle to have, and we struggle to have, but we have a great Savior who is living in the heavens, advocating on our behalf, dealing with our guilt so that it doesn't become an extra burden to living life, and being able to have the strength and power of the Holy Spirit to live that righteous life, to make those choices. And that's the fruit that's born out of righteousness. So when we repent, we turn away from what is opposed to God's will. We turn toward and pursue righteousness in our lives. You know, we have all different images and views and ideas of what righteousness is. Many of them are, are these lists of things, that, of do's and don'ts. Most of us forget the Beatitudes, loving our neighbor, giving to those who persecute us, being selfless and meek. Those are the acts of righteousness that change people's lives. Now, I'm, I'm not advocating that we shouldn't look at the effects of sin in our world and some of the different things that are happening in our world, but what music we listen to doesn't necessarily make us righteous or unrighteous. Or you fill in the blank of the other things that you think might be there. Because the fact is, is that Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And regardless of what music we listen to, or, again, fill in that blank, regardless of those things, what are people going to see? If they see somebody who doesn't live, or doesn't care, doesn't love their neighbor, do they really care what you listen to? Is that going to make a difference? And that's, that is what I would call a matter of conscience for every believer. You know, those little things, that's a matter of conscience. There's no matter of conscience when it comes to loving our neighbor. I stink at it. I'm just going to tell you because I, like I told you in the beginning, the whole brood of vipers thing, that's usually my go-to when I'm driving down the road, you know. Somebody's in front of me going too slow, or somebody's right up on my bumper and I'm going too slow. Any of those things. I have a hard time loving my neighbor. I have a hard time loving my neighbor when they say things that are not true about me. I have a really hard time loving my neighbor. I have a hard time loving my neighbor when he snow blows his snow into my yard. That doesn't happen anymore where I live, but it used to happen at one time and it was rather annoying. Christ has called us to bear fruit of righteous lives. And we do it for the sake of those around us. Not because he's going to save us, because he has already offered you salvation. He has given you new life, and he's given you the power to repent and to turn to righteousness and live that life in an amazing way. Christ has called each of us to be great in the kingdom. Mark 10, 43 through 44. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. This is what he wants for us, every one of us, to be great. To be great like the great preacher. To be a great man like John the Baptist, just the thing that he said about him. So then you have to ask yourself, if that's true of you and me, what is your mission? Are we here to remove the obstacles and make the way straight that lead to the king of kings for our neighbors and our, our friends and our family and those around us? Is that what our mission is? Does our repentance lead to righteousness? that leads to fruit in God's kingdom. 
Is that what our mission is? I hope it is. I hope that we would take the example of John and not just say he was, an, he was a miraculous, a miraculous character in the Bible. Wow, isn't that amazing? What should I do, God? What's your will for my life? To be that same character. To be a man or a woman that preaches righteousness and lives righteousness. Righteousness.